Today, we're talking nine tips to make you a Kamado Joe master. Let's get into it. What's up, barbecue fans? Welcome back to the patio. My name's Jake, you're watching Roman Cook. Today on the patio, we've got the big Joe out and I'm sharing with you nine tips to make you a Kamado Joe master. So if you've been using one for a while, most of these tips you're probably aware of, but maybe not all of them. If you're new to Kamado cooking, this one's for you. This will help really step up your game and help you skip a couple of learning steps. So I'm gonna do these in order. And the number one is make sure you start with a clean basket. Each and every time you wanna empty out the basket and get rid of all the old ash. Now you can keep the old lump that's in there, no problem. Just give it a shake and get rid of all that ash and clean it out. Because when we start a new cook, we're gonna fill it up with ash again. And if it's already full of ash, you're not gonna get the air movement that we want. And it's just gonna cause issues with adjusting your temperatures. Number two, use a quality lump. I can't overstate the importance of this one. Lump comes in all different sorts of price ranges. You can find it everywhere, including at the grocery store. But if you buy a low quality lump, two things are gonna happen. Number one, it's not gonna get super hot, you're gonna need a whole bunch of it to get really hot for pizzas. And number two, it's not gonna last long. So it's gonna get hot and then it's gonna, you're gonna go through it very, very quickly because it's not very dense and it's just not gonna burn as stable. You're gonna have some temperature fluctuations and it's gonna work against you. So my two go-tos for lump is the Komodo Joe Big Block or Fogo. Fogo has a black bag and the super premium bag. I typically use a lot of the super premium bag. Either or will work. There are some other quality brands out there. I don't know them all, but I've been using those two six years at this point, seven years, I guess. So the other brands out there, just don't go buy yourself a $10 bag of lump and think it's gonna work out, right? I think in the States here, this is probably around 24, 25 to 30 for a 20 pound bag. So somewhere around that price point is where you're probably gonna end up being. I have seen what happens when you use a low quality lump and it will definitely make you very frustrated. Number three, don't overfill your basket. Now, the great thing about lump is if you don't use it all, you can reuse it, but a couple things will happen. Uh, number one, it doesn't get as hot. Uh, number two, it's harder to light. So usually what I'll do is I'll always, no matter how much is in there, I'll always add a little bit of fresh lump on there just to make it easier to get going. Uh, but in general, there's no reason to fill up your basket every time, right? If you're doing a quick grilling session, maybe some wings, burgers, or dogs, right? you probably only need a quarter basket, drop down your grates and cook over that. If you're doing a longer cook, you probably want a quarter to a half basket. Uh, if you're doing, you know, like a 12 hour brisket, yeah, fill that baby up. Maybe the other thing you would do, or the other time you would do that is, let's say you're making pizzas and you got some people over and you're gonna cook like six or eight pizzas, fill that up and get the whole thing going because you're gonna keep it super hot for a long period of time. You're gonna burn through some lump. So today I'm doing two cooks, so I'm gonna use about three quarters of a basket. You probably notice these chunks are a little bit small. I'm right near the end of a bag and I just wanna burn through it. But in general, don't overfill your basket. Number four, light according to your cook. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you're gonna do a low temperature smoke around 225, if you light a whole bunch of lump, you're gonna way overshoot your temperatures and then you're going to have a little bit of a problem getting it back down low. The opposite of that is if you don't light enough, you're gonna light this up, you're gonna open up all your vents, you're gonna walk inside for 30 minutes and it's not gonna be the temperature you want. So I have a couple different rules of thumb. There's two different ways to light it. We've got our grill gun, which is super handy, the fastest way to light. And then we've got what I've used for many years. These are the Komodo Joe fire starters. Any wax fire starter will work. Let me pull these guys out here. But this is what it looks like, right? And we've got a couple different, uh, there's eight pieces here, right? So I can burn, I can break these off and break them down again. So here's my rules of thumb. So if I'm gonna be around 225, I will use one of these, put it in the center, light it, and away we go. For the grill gun, I'll probably only light about 30 seconds. Now, if I'm gonna go 300 to 350, I'm gonna use two of these. I'm gonna spread them out a little bit. We're gonna get a little bit more lump going. I'm gonna use my grill gun for probably 45 or 50 seconds. If I'm gonna do pizzas, super high temperature cook over 450, I'm gonna use three of these, especially for pizzas, and I'm gonna kinda lay them out in a triangle. So we're getting a very wide area lit. 
because I want to get my whole pizza stone equally uh, up to temperature, right? I don't want a hot spot on my pizza stone. So I'll spread these out, I'll light these guys up. This guy, I'm gonna use the whole cert top area and I'm gonna go probably a minute to a minute and 20 seconds, right? But again, we're gonna try and get this whole area lit up. What that does is that allows you to get up to temperatures as quick as possible, but prevents you from overshooting your temperatures and just saves you a little bit of frustration. Number five is all about smoking wood placement. Now I'm doing these a little bit out of order because today when I'm cooking, I'm not gonna be using any wood and I didn't wanna to have to dig it out later. But here we've got a big old piece of pecan. Now, a couple rules here. Really, you want no more than 10 or 15% wood. Don't use a ton of wood because you will just over smoke the heck out of something and no one wants to eat that. Uh, it will not turn out good. So, you know, a few pieces about this size are more than enough. But typically what you want to do if you're doing a long, slow cook is you want to bury two or three pieces at the very bottom, pour the lump on top, and then what will happen here is as this warms up and starts to smolder, that smoke is going to go through the burning lump and it's going to clean it up. It's almost like it's twice burning the smoke, much like a solo fire pit or a Brio fire pit where they've got the holes around there and it sucks the smoke through and burns it twice and you don't, you get a smokeless fire pit, right? Same type of thing here. It's gonna clean up the smoke. Now, you can put some on top. If it's the beginning of the cook, put it on top and let it clear up for five, 10 minutes. You know, you don't wanna see any white billowing smoke. If you see some smoke, it's not the end of the world. There's a lot of talk out there about clean versus dirty smoke. And most people have decided that using a little bit of dirty smoke at the beginning is not gonna hurt anything. And let's say you're halfway through the cook, you're not, you, don't, you can't smell any smoke, you can't see any smoke, but you still have a long ways to go and you wanna add some more smoke to it, throw a piece on top, right? You're gonna get dirty smoke for 10, 15 minutes, but you're gonna get some smoke going. It is not gonna ruin your cook. All right, people are getting a little crazy with this whole, everything's gotta be clean smoke. If it's 100% clean smoke the entire time, it will be great. But if you mix up a little bit of dirty smoke, um, especially in an offset, it actually adds a little bit more flavor. I've tried it in here, same thing. It doesn't hurt your food. So don't be afraid to add another little piece as you're going through your cook. Number six, you gotta make a very important decision. Are you doing an indirect cook, a direct cook, or a combination of both? And what do I mean by that? So indirect, we have a cooler zone and we don't have a fire burning or a heat source burning directly underneath of us. The way we accomplish this in a Kimono Joe is we put in a heat deflector to cover up that hot lump. That way the hot air goes around it so we're still getting heat to cook our food, but we're not getting direct heat touching our food. Direct is where you're doing a sear, or you're doing some burgers, or some wings, some sausages, some, some dog, right? You're gonna cook those just over, just like a normal charcoal grill, you're cooking them directly over that heat source, you're gonna get some nice char on them, you're gonna get some of that great charcoal flavor, and away you go, right? In the case of a reverse sear, you put it indirect until you're up to temperature, and then you put it direct to get that nice sear on your steak. So you gotta figure out what kind of cook you're doing and set up your Kamado Joe appropriately. Number seven is all about what makes a Kamado Joe so special, and that is all about heat soaking properly. What is heat soaking? So this is made up of some very thick material, and what we want is we wanna get it hot, right? Our fire's down here. We need to get our dome hot. We need to get the whole thing, what we call heat soaked. It's gonna take 20 minutes or so, depending on what temperature you're at maybe as long as 30 minutes, depending on how quickly you get up the temperature. But what you wanna do is you wanna get this guy up the temperature, get your temperature locked in, and then let it sit for 15, 20, 30 minutes before you start cooking. Now, if you're just using this as a traditional grill, you're grilling some wings, dogs, burgers, sausages, that type of thing, don't worry about it, right? We're just gonna do some direct cooking and that's all we care about. If you're doing a longer cook, say spatchcock chicken, roasted chicken, turkeys, uh, smoking the butt, brisket, all that type of thing. Uh, then you wanna get it heat soaked because what happens here, and this is where these really ex excel, the first time you do chicken on here, it's gonna blow your mind. And the reason why it works so well is what happens is this gets all nice and heat soaked, and now we have all this heat energy firing back at our meat, 360 degrees. So what happens, first thing you're gonna notice is that number one, things cook 
a lot quicker in a Kamado Joe than they do on some of the other options out there. Second thing you're gonna notice is that when you cook a chicken, it's gonna be some juicy chicken, right? There is almost no airflow in here. When we're dialed in, you know, I got like one inch down there and maybe I'm about halfway in there. I'm sitting there around 350-ish, 300, 325. There's not a lot of air coming through there, right? So what happens is these retain moisture very, very well because we don't have any air movement drawing out that moisture away from the meat. So make sure you spend a little bit of extra time in heat soak because when you turn out your final product, it's gonna turn out that much better. Number eight is all about your temperatures. When you're cooking something, you gotta have the right temperatures for the results you're trying to achieve, right? If you're doing a low, slow smoke, you don't want it running at 300, you want it running maybe 225 or 250, depending on what you're trying to do. But one of the mistakes that people make when they're new to Kamado Joe's is they chase their temperatures, right? Part of that is the cheap lung, but the other part is your vent settings. So the biggest piece of advice I can give you here is make an adjustment and wait. It's not instant. It's gonna take five, seven minutes for you to see that temperature move and lock in, sometimes as much as 10, depending on how big of an adjustment you're making. So make an adjustment, wait, check it out, make an adjustment again. But if you keep making adjustments every three minutes, you're gonna chase your temperatures and you're gonna hate it. The other thing I can tell you here is that, look, we're only open up an inch down here at the bottom right now. It is far easier if you only adjust one vent rather than trying to adjust them both. So, you know, when you're starting it up, you're gonna open this all the way up and we're gonna have max air going through there. But once we get time to lock in, take this down to an inch. Now we have one thing adjusting our temperature. Now up top here, we've got four lines. And if you go just inside or just on the other side of that first line, we're going to be around 225. Then we're going to be at the second line, we're going to be around 250, maybe 300 in the middle, 350 at the third line, 400 in the middle and 450 tops wide open. Right now, it's going to depend how much lump you have burning, the quality of the lump and everything. Those are super, super rough guidelines. If you want to go beyond 400 or 450, now you got to start to open up our bottom one. So maybe you give it, you know, a couple inches to get up to that 500. If you're gonna go pizzas and you're gonna go six, seven, 800 degrees, you're probably gonna have it wide open. And now you can start to do something like this. We can open up our whole top, right? You can also go at a different, you can leave this alone, keep this at an inch, and now we can start to open up our top. The problem once you start to open the top is, you know, if you have it halfway and you open the dome, it's gonna, uh, it can move a little bit. So usually, by the time I'm opening up the top dome, I'm going pizzas or super hot sear mode. But I can't stress enough, take your time and don't over correct your vents. We're at the final tip. If you're getting some value out of this and you like what you're seeing so far, give it a thumbs up. While you're down there, hit subscribe. Doing a 25,000 subscriber giveaway, we're almost there. Super easy to enter that if you like. All you gotta do is you gotta go to my website, rumcook.com, scroll all the way down and sign up for the newsletter and I'll be doing a giveaway once we hit 25,000 subscribers. Tip number nine, learn to cook the temperature. Forget about what you're reading online or what you're watching on YouTube. I mean, except for my channel, of course. But these are all guidelines, right? Every piece of meat is different. Every smoker cooks differently. You don't know the temperature that they held the cook at the entire time, right? Use it as guidelines. Get yourself a good quality instant read thermometer. These are my chef's temps. They come in three colors. I'm personally like an orange because it's on brand with my color, uh, but they have some other colors out there. But a good instant read thermometer serves two purposes. If you're cooking poultry or a steak or a pork chop, right? You're gonna use this to figure out what temperature you wanna cook at and when it's gonna be done. Little side tip there for poultry. The reason why people tell you to cook it to 165 is because that's when the bacteria is instantly killed. Did you know if you cook it to 155 and you hold it there for three minutes, the exact same thing happens? So cook your poultry to 150 if it's a turkey or a big chicken. If it's a chicken breast, maybe cook it to 155. Either way, you're going to have a little bit of carryover and you're going to get up to that 155 for more than three minutes. And what's going to happen is you're going to have some juicy poultry. For your steak, 
learn your steak temperatures. Pork, they used to say it had to be cooked to 165. It was dry and rubbery. Now 145 is your target temperature. Anything above, right? Remember, you're gonna see a little bit of pink in that pork. The other thing you, you use this for is this is your probe to tell tenderness. If you're doing a brisket or you're doing pulled pork or you're doing braised short ribs, right? You wanna use this to feel your temperature because there is not a done temperature for brisket. You gotta use this and it should feel like warm peanut butter or soft butter. There should not be any give when you push in, right? Same thing for your ribs, right? You wanna be able to get in there nice and tender when you pull those off. So temperature and probe, that'll tell you the tenderness of your meat. But if you learn to cook the temperature, I guarantee you, you're gonna turn out much better food. So that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you got some value out of this. Again, if you did, please like and subscribe down below. Thanks as always for watching. I'll see you soon.